going to continue our study of the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 4. We're going to look at 19 through 22 this morning, but I want to go back to the beginning because it's all tied together. So let's go back to the beginning of chapter 4 and read uh, verses 1 through 22. Chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence thou hast, uh, then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go and call thy husband, and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. But thou sayest, in that thou sayest truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And yea, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Well, let's pray. We'll pray silently for just a moment. And we'll try to understand what these words are all about. Father, we do thank you for the written word of God that you inspired and that you preserved over all these years. And now we want to prosper from our reading of the word through the preaching of the word. Faith cometh by hearing the word. And so, as always, I ask for your help. For the Spirit of God, if we don't have the Spirit to help us, then all is lost. But with His Spirit, uh, the Word of God is mighty. And we want this mighty Word to accomplish your sovereign purposes, both in the lives of the believers and unbelievers this morning. We ask that you might do that in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the most dramatic ceremonies in the history of Old Testament Israel took place on two hills in a region that would later be called Samaria. After Israel had crossed into the Promised Land and in accordance with God's instructions given to Moses, half of the 12 tribes formed on Mount Gerizim and the other half formed on the adjacent Mount Ebal. From Mount Gerizim, God's blessings for obedience were given. And I'm reading now from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 2 through 6. So you're a Jew, you're on Mount Gerizim, and this is what was read. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. 
Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shalt the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of the kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. That's how the, the Israelites would be blessed if they were obedient to God. But that wasn't the only possibility because curses were read to the other six tribes there on Mount Ebal in the event that the people were disobedient. And now I'm reading Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 19. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed thou shalt be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. So, there Israel had two choices that they were facing in the promised land, just as they face today. The ceremony ended, however, with a very important lesson regarding biblical salvation. Because God directed, after the blessing and curses were read, that an altar be built on one of those two mountains. There the people would come and worship him. The question is, which mountain? Are we going to worship him on the mountain with all the blessings or the mountain with all the curses? In other words, are they come to, going to come to God by works or are they going to come to God by grace? Deuteronomy chapter 27 verses 4 through 5 gives the answer. Therefore, it shall be when ye be gone over Jordan that ye shall set up these stones which I command you this day in Mount Ebal. And thou shalt place them there with placer, and thou shalt build an altar unto the Lord thy God, and an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron and tool upon them. And so they're going to worship him on the mountain where the curses were. This is a lesson of salvation is not by works, but by grace. No sinner can have salvation on Mount Gerizim because they've already failed to obey God's law. The blessings offered through the merits of work have been lost through disobedience. And therefore, God has mercifully opened the door of grace on Mount Ebal by the blood of Christ so that those cursed because of their disobedience might be forgiven and that they might be blessed. Now, all of that that I've just said plays in our important study of John 4 because the Samaritan woman refers to Mount Gerizim where she says in verse 20, our fathers worship in this mountain. And she's pointing to Mount Gerizim. See, the Samaritans had long worshipped a Mount Gerizim, treating it as the greatest of all mountains and scorning the idea of, that worship should be offered at the temple that was built on Mount Zion there in Jerusalem. The Samaritan Bible only had the five books of the Bible. They didn't have the rest of the Old Testament. So they only had Genesis to Deuteronomy, and they excluded the rest of the Old Testament. In addition, and listen to this, in their Bible, they had the Samaritan Revised Version, I guess. In, in their Bible, they changed Deuteronomy 27 and verse 4 that instructed that worship was to be on Mount Ebal. They changed that to Mount Gerizim as a place where the altar should be built. A lot of modern versions do that today, and they say, well, we kind of believe this way, so we'll make the Bible say this. So, they say they're supposed to worship on Mount Gerizim, and that's where they built their temple. And that made the Jews so angry, one of their leaders came and destroyed that temple in 128 B.C. Jacob's well, where Jesus and the Samaritan woman were sitting there talking, sat at the foot of Mount Gerizim, and they might have been able to see the ruins of the temple from where they sat. Now, in our previous sermon, we remember that Jesus brought 
the Samaritan woman under conviction of her sin. Jesus saith unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. And he exposed her sinful marital and sexual sin in her life. And the woman, hearing that, she probably was a little embarrassed. She probably was a little taken aback. And she says in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then she talks about our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And we say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now, there are two views for her motive in making this statement, kind of changing the subject away from her sin. One view says that the woman is changing the subject away from this unpleasant subject of her sin by appealing to a, a theological controversy. She wants to steer the conversation away from this unpleasant subject of her sin, so she brings in this distraction. We're going to talk about mountains, and we're going to talk about worship right now. That's one view of why she said that. Another view of what she said I think is more positive. Uh, J.C. Ryle tells us this. She was alarmed by having her sin suddenly exposed. She found herself for the first time the necessity of religion. But at once the old question between the Jews and the Samaritans arose in her mind. How was she to know what's the truth? And this matter of the location of proper worship was especially important if she realized her need for a sacrifice for her sin uh, that Jesus had just exposed. That's what we do. We offer sacrifices for our sins. And Jesus exposed her. She's wide open, uh, exposed for her sins. And I, I need to know how to worship right. I need to know where to offer a sacrifice. And no matter what this motive, the, the motive works for this woman, her question in and of itself is very important. We might put the idea a bit more clearly and also more generally if we ask, what's the difference between true religion and false religion? The Samaritans, they're trying to worship their idea of God in the way that seemed best for them. They even made their Bible to say what was best for them. They were probably sincere in their religion, but it was still a false religion because it was based on the ignorance of the true God. Ye worship, ye know not what, Jesus said. Without knowledge from God, their ideas of God and salvation and worship were bound to be wrong. So here's another case of unbelief. The Gospel of John's already given us several other causes of unbelief. Ignorance of God's revealed word is another cause of unbelief. The Samaritan woman was a victim of the false teaching that she had received. Paul described in the New Testament such people as having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. So much ignorance, and that's true today, so much biblical ignorance because no one wants to read the Bible and study it for themselves then just find someone that they like and they go and listen to him or whatever he says goes or whatever she says goes in this day and age and this is what this woman was like she was brought up in this false religion that the Samaritans did and that's all she knew that's all she knew most people today are like this woman in fact the approach that most people take to religion that is to ultimate matters such as God, the meaning of life, the way of salvation is much, much worse than what she did. The Samaritans at least had a partial revelation from God, however corrupt it was, but most people today have a, a mishmash of religious ideas that don't even fit together, but they serve a self-centered approach to religion. A certain pastor once had a congregation on an airplane, and that bears this out. There was an out, outgoing young man across the aisle from where he sat, and he noticed that the pastor was reading a Christian book, and so he wanted to exchange ideas regarding religious views. And he told him, the young man said, I believe in karma, which means that ultimately we get what we deserve, right? Karma, you get what's coming to you. If you have bad karma, then you're going to be affected with bad things. If you have good karma, then you're going to have good things happen to you. 
uh, the pastor repeatedly pressed him for the source of that belief. Why do you believe that? Why do you believe? What source of information teaches you that karma is truth? And he continually replied that it's, it's just my opinion. He was ignorant of the Bible despite growing up in Roman Catholic schools. And so the pastor kept trying to show him that his religious views were not simply wrong, but that they were based on ignorance of what God has actually revealed. Now, in contrast to false, uninformed religion exemplified by this woman at the well, Jesus admits that the religion of the Jews was true. You worship you know not what, we know what we worship, he says in verse 22. And this makes the point that true religion is based on the revealed word of God. This is what set the Old Testament religion apart from the paganism that surrounded it. And this is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion today. Back to the conversation in the airplane. Over and over again, the man gave the pastor his opinion and then asked the pastor for his opinion. And over and over again, he replied, the pastor did, my opinion doesn't matter. What matters is what God has revealed in his word. At several points, the young man objected saying, I don't want to know what the Bible says. I just want to know what you think. And each time the pastor replied, I think that my ignorance needs to be informed by God's word, indicating that that was the same for the young man. Now, it's noteworthy to mention that the man had assumed that all religions teach the same thing, namely salvation by good works. That's what karma is. You do good, good things happen to you. You do bad, bad things happen to you. Note that thought. This is the idea about how people get to heaven. Most people out there in the world today think they, they think uh, a little bit of good outweighing my bad and I get to heaven. <clears throat> Same was true of this Samaritan woman and her worship on Mount Gerizim. It made sense to them to try to gain God's favor by their works in accordance with the blessings that come with obedience that have been read from that mountain. You see how it all ties in? Oh, we're going to do what the Mount Gerizim told them to do. And we'll get all these blessings by being obedient to God. Christianity and Christianity alone of all the religions differs with this view. Christianity insists that God offers salvation to sinners through the blood of Jesus Christ. John 3.16 that we all know so well summarizes our gospel for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Nothing in there about doing good and getting your way to heaven. This is a religion by God's grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it was symbolized in Joshua's day by the altar of blood sacrifices on Mount Ebal, the mountain of man's failure and his sin. This Christian gospel is contrary to everything the world believes and teaches. Only the Bible says that man is hopelessly lost in sin. But God in his grace offered his son's blood to be shed in our place so that faith in him, apart from any idea of our meriting salvation by good works, we are justified by God and then enter into eternal life. Therefore, with regard to salvation, Christians say to the unbelieving world, you worship what you know, you know not what, but we know what we worship. We say that as Christians to the rest of the world. And what we know and believe is the gospel of Christ revealed in the inspired word of God. Since God has spoken through the Bible, true religion is a biblical religion. It isn't a pearl of great price religion. It is not a religion of any other book 
other than the Bible. And therefore, as the pastor's plane landed and the discussion with his unbelieving co-passenger ended, he urged him to read the Bible for himself, since the Bible is not only the source of religious truth, but also the power by which sinners are born again to salvation. And I challenge all people, read the Bible for yourself. Not very many people do. They just come up with a religion of their own thinking. Now, it wasn't by chance that the Jews were the ones who knew about the things of God. Rather, this was by God's design, as Jesus explained by saying, salvation is of the Jews. There at the end of verse 22. Jesus' point wasn't of some kind of ethnic arrogance, but rather God's purpose in history. The reason that the Jews were right about worship was that God had determined to bring salvation to the world through them. This was true. First of all, because God's saving relationship came through the Jews. The message of salvation that we have today came through the Jews. All of the Old Testament was written by Jewish authors because God had chosen to reveal his light to the world through this one singular nation. This is why to reject the prophets, as the Samaritans had done, we just had the first books in the Bible, uh, to reject the prophets was to reject God's truth. And so they had. God gave Israel this mission found in Isaiah 42.6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people. Why? For a light of the Gentiles. There it's spelled out for us. Now the Jews forsook God's calling by despising rather than evangelizing these nations around them. Nevertheless, it remained the case that to learn the truth about God, one had to turn to the Jews and their Bible. Nowhere else. One must not turn to the Greek philosophers. We don't care what Socrates and Plato have to say. We're not going to listen to the Roman orators or to the mystics of the East. We're going to listen to the scriptures of the humble Jewish people through whom God gave his word to the world. But salvation is of the Jews is not only because they were chosen to write and preserve the scriptures. More importantly, God promised to send his Messiah through the Jews. This is the most vital, important message provided in the Old Testament. God promised Israel's King David that from his offspring would come one who shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. 2 Samuel 7, 13 and 14. The Old Testament tells us how the Messiah would, be, would free us all from the yoke of sin. In Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 6. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is why John the Baptist was not only the last greatest Old Testament prophet, because it was given to him the privilege of pointing to the long-awaited Savior, you recall what we studied in John chapter 1 and verse 29. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he proclaimed boldly, what? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Here's the Messiah that was promised throughout the Old Testament. This last Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist, was saying. Now, the Samaritan woman could not have known these things apart from the Jews. And given Jewish hostility toward the Samaritans, she was condemned to perish in ignorance. This is why Jesus went to Samaria. This is why it was needs he must be going to Samaria. In fact, his coming to the woman at the well signifies a new breakthrough in which salvation was passing from the Jews to the world. 
Jesus is coming, revolutionize the availability of salvation to the entire world. Jesus said to her in verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. References to Jesus' hour in John's gospel is always in reference to his death on the cross. His death would accomplish all that the Old Testament and its temple prefigured by offering the true and final atonement by which sinners can come to God. Henceforth, there would be no need for centralized worship in Jerusalem, for an atonement for sin was made available not just on Mount Zion, but for wherever sinners trust in the blood of Christ for salvation. Not just in Israel, not just in Iran or Iraq or China or the United States, everywhere is where he can be worshipped now. Not just in Jerusalem. Question is, have you come to Jesus for salvation? Have you confessed your sins and brought them to the cross to be redeemed by his blood? In Jesus' day, salvation was of the Jews, but now it is from Christ and him alone. The only true religion now is to worship God as forgiven sinners through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we're learning this morning. Now I want to switch gears here for a moment and focus on the latter part of this sermon with some remarks concerning Christians and Jews because the relationship between these two are very similar to the Jews and the Samaritans during Jesus' day. First thing for us to realize is that the tragedy of the Jews, apart from faith in Jesus, is that they are now separated from God by the same ignorance that separated the Samaritans and Gentiles. Like the Samaritans, who rejected the prophets and thus worshiped falsely on Mount Gerizim, having misrepresented what they had, so also the Jews rejected the New Testament and its message about Jesus. Without the New Testament, they really can't even understand their Old Testament. Now it must be said of the Jews what the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, once said to the Samaritan woman, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. This fulfills numerous prophecies from the Old Testament in which God promised that because of the hardness of the hearts, the Jews would become like the Gentiles in ignorance, unbelief, and alienated from salvation. And this was the point of the curses that were read on Mount Evil. If the Israelites would not worship at the altar that God had provided for sinners, the cross of Jesus Christ, the result could only be the curses that their sins deserve. To read the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 68, we don't have time to read all those. I would uh, ask you to do that maybe this afternoon. What you're going to see in those curses can be see seen chronicled in the centuries, in the, in, in the plight of the Jews over the, after the rejection of Jesus Christ. One bad thing after another, after another, after another, to this very day. Bombs are raining down on the Jews over in Israel to this very day. And it all goes back to the rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. And the worst curse of all is that they are alienated from God and his word. Thus, the Jews today are like the Gentiles and the Samaritans of old in their ignorance of salvation and the continuing of their dead religion. Second, instead of treating Jewish people with the contempt that the Jews showed the Samaritans, as by the way, sadly, many Christians have done over the years, we should love them as God's ancient people. Remember, salvation is of the Jews. Salvation come to, came to us through them, and so we seek their salvation with a particular zeal. The New Testament says, to the Jew first, the gospel should go. So, if Jesus wearied himself to bring the gospel 
to the ignorant Samaritans, how much more ought we to share the truth of Christ to unbelieving Jews? It is our mandate to do so. And if it glorifies God to save Gentiles through the gospel, how much more to restore these fallen Jews? Additionally, we should evangelize Jews in a manner similar to how Jews ought to have evangelized the Samaritans. We should start with their false understanding of scriptures that they have and their tragic rejection of God's further revelation in the New Testament. The Jews, they should have informed the Samaritans that Moses had ordered the altar to be built on Mount Ebal, not Mount Gerizim, and then on Mount Zion, and that God's way of salvation to sinners is by grace and not according to works. That's how they should have evangelized the Samaritans instead of hating them. Likewise, we should direct Jewish people to the Old Testament prophecies and their New Testament fulfillments that prove that Jesus is the Messiah. There's probably enough in Isaiah chapter 53 alone to convince someone that the whole, a Jew that the Holy Spirit is dealing with that Jesus is the Messiah. Several weeks ago, you might recall, I introduced a guy to you named Stan Telchin. Remember that? He was a Jewish man who was led to Christ by his daughter. As is usually the case, her witness succeeded because Stan felt the spiritual void that his false religion did not fulfill and because he had seen a wonderful change in the life of his daughter. But he was also persuaded when he saw the truth about Jesus being fulfilled in the Old Testament. He was shown in Jesus the true king from the line of David, the true prophet promised by Moses, the true priest whom Aaron was a representative of. He saw the true sacrifice who died for our sins. He saw the true Passover lamb at the cross, the true exodus into the new birth and the true promised land and the eternal life that Jesus gives. Stan tells him, came to that as a former Jew, just looking at the Old Testament. When he realized that he believed on Jesus, Satan, or Stan explained it to his wife, and with, his, uh, and with this beautiful Jewish profession of faith. These are his words from his book, Betrayed. Without any doubt, I believe in the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe the Bible is God's inspired word, and I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's a saved man. Saved man. Now, in Romans chapter 11, Paul encouraged us to hope for a vast ingathering of Jews who will, like Stan, proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ before the end of this gospel age. Paul explained it in some detail. Romans chapter 11, verse 2, then verse 11, and then verse 25 and 26. Let me read these words to what the Apostle Paul had to say about the Jews. I say then, had they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come into the Gentiles. For to provoke them, meaning the Jews, to jealousy. Now, to fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, we don't know if such an ingathering of the Jews might happen, but, but we do hope, it, we don't know when it's going to happen, but we hope it's going to happen soon. And we should prayerfully work to that end in presenting the gospel to them. There's a guy, you probably never heard of him. He was an English Jew. Ferdinand Zwig was his name. And he taught at the Hebrew and the Tel Aviv universities. And he admitted this. 
the Jewish religion seems to be at present to the large mass of Israeli Jews uninspiring and uninspired. Could it be that Jesus could give it a new lease on life? That's from a Jewish professor. He wrote a book called Israel, the Sword in the Heart. There was another German Jewish philosopher whose name was Constantine Brunner. And he speaks for many Jews who have not yet turned to faith in Jesus, but whose words are showing that they might be open to evangelism. Listen to what this guy has to say. It's only the, is it only the Jew who is incapable of seeing and hearing all that others see and hear? Are the Jews stricken with blindness and deafness as regards Messiah Jesus, so that to them alone he has nothing to say? Understand then what we shall do. We shall bring him back to us. Messiah Jesus is not dead for us, for he has not yet lived, and he will not slay us, he will make us alive again. His profound and holy words and all that is true and hard appealing, appealing in the New Testament must from now on be heard in our synagogues and taught to our children in order that the wrong we have committed may be made good. The curse turned to a blessing and that he at last may find us who has always been seeking after us. That's remarkable from a Jewish guy who wrote it in a book called The Messiahship of Jesus. Are Jews changing their attitude toward Jesus? This was written by a man who had not yet professed faith in Jesus Christ. His words might hint at a work that God is doing among Jewish hearers so that we should be specially bold in speaking the Bible's truth to them. That should be our relationship with Jewish people. Now third, Christians are to realize that if God's ancient people, the Jews, could lose their place in the world through unbelief toward Jesus and, and hardened hearts toward God's, what's going to happen if Christian churches do the same? These people turn their back on God and his Messiah. What if Christian churches do the same? You know, the first churches were located mostly in Syria and Turkey, lands where Christianity is almost non-existent now. Those churches that we read about in, in uh, the book of Revelation, they're just ruins now. Nobody's there worshiping in them. The same happened in once Christian Europe, which is now a spiritual wasteland. It's a spiritual wasteland. And now America is turning away from God in no small part. There's worldliness in our Christian churches and a failure on the part of believers to boldly proclaim the true gospel of God and to live by his word. That's a description of what's taking place in America today. And Paul's warning to the Gentile believers of his day is well suited to us as well. Romans 11, 20 and 21. The Jews, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And now stand us by faith. Christians, be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. We better watch out, Christians in America, we better heed the warning. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, ye worship, ye know not what. That's what we say to the unbelieving world out there, and to many so-called Christian churches. We know what we worship, Jesus said. Let's be sure that we do. Let's be sure that we know God's word so graciously provided to us in the Bible. This is God's word to us. Let's know it. Let's read it. Let's understand it. Let our salvation be the Bible's gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and not this ridiculous Arminian gospel that's preached in the vast majority of churches today. And let our light shine so brightly today as the Jews were supposed to shine their light among the Gentiles so that others might see the truth and the love 
that Jesus has for the world in the fact that God gave his son to the world. Because our salvation was once from the Jews, today's salvation is from Christians through our witness of Jesus Christ. It comes through us now. Are we going to fail like the Jews? Are we going to look at the world and say, oh well, let them go to hell. We don't care. Is that going to be our attitude? Me and mine, we're safely in the arms of Jesus. I don't really feel like witnessing. I don't really feel like talking to my relatives and my friends and my co-workers about Jesus. Is that the attitude? Or are we going to let our light shine before men? Because we are the light. There's none other. We're the light that brings the light into the world by giving the gospel. This gospel that says we are all sinners. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every last one of us. There's none that seeketh righteousness. No, not one. We're all dead. How can we be made spiritually alive? Only through Jesus Christ. Through his spirit. He breathes into you spiritual life and gives you faith and repentance. And you trust in Christ and Christ alone. You put aside all this nonsense of being good and you'll get good. If I do this and this and this, I'll get to heaven. No, you won't. The only people that get to heaven are those who trust in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, his blood, paying for their sin. He had no sin. He paid for your sin. Not for his. And you trust in simple childlike faith. We trust everyone here has done that. We trust that everyone listening will do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truths that we have learned this morning from the Old Testament and the New Testament from your word. And we believe your word. We trust in your word. It's all we have. If your word is false, then we have a false religion. And we have no hope whatsoever. But your word in the Old Testament points forward to Jesus as the Messiah. The Old Testament, the New Testament points back to the accomplished work of Jesus as our Messiah. He came to do what you sent him to do, to seek and to save sinners. He purchased their souls on the cross by paying for their sin. Thank you, dear Jesus, for saving our souls. We worship you for that and for everything else you bring to, to, into our lives. And for the lost that don't know him, we pray, dear Lord Jesus, through the mighty work of your Holy Spirit, using your word, because faith cometh by hearing the word. Use your word to save your people, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.